Hello, and welcome to Stories on the Way, circling in on our experiences to inspire insight and action. We're taught by the wise ones that the way is the path, and the path is the way. This means that all of our life experiences, delightful or deplorable, are opportunities to see, learn, and grow. I'm Karina Krepp, a holistic health practitioner, author, and speaker. And I'm Julie Rhodes, Wayfinder coach, yoga and breathwork teacher, speaker, and writer. Karina and I have each devoted our lives to discovery and optimization along the path. And we believe the stories on the way offer great insight into our ongoing creation of peaceful, abundant, and joyful lives. In fact, it's the stories that are the invitations to this creation and our ultimate freedom. And now we're extending our invitation to you. Each week, we'll explore a topic through the lens of our distinct stories with deep listening, curious inquiry, and likely some intentional breathing, movement, a few tears and laughter and everything in between. Please do come along as we all find our way. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stories on the Way. We are circling in on our experiences to inspire insight and action. And I'm ready for some insights today. Karina, are you, are you with me? I'm so with you. This was a good topic because it was really big. Yeah, it was, it was big and it was so multi-layered. Yes. Um, it was fun as I asked people and I sort of brought it up. They would say, do you mean like this? And I'd be or like, if that's what came up for you, then that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. And um, it was so interesting because I felt a great divide between people that saw it as a dangerous place and people who saw it as the moment before something amazing happened. It was really interesting to um, to get that. So let's uh, let's dive in. So uh, for first time listeners, you may not know, but the way that we're going to do this is that this is our topic this week, The Edge. And I'm going to tell a story from my life about the edge and Karina and I will discuss. And then Karina is going to tell her story. And then we're going to look at some outside points of view. And then we're going to, after all of that insight, we're going to come back and say, well, what actions are we going to take now that we've told these stories and had these insights? So my, my story starts when I'm, 27 years old. So on the cusp of my Saturn return, which you could say right there is an edge, right? Um, at right, uh, Saturn makes its great big orbit and is about to start again. That That is an edge in and of itself. And I was 27. So I was trying different things. I, you know, over the course of my 20s had graduated from college, got a job, switched jobs, decided to go to graduate school, got a job based on the graduate school, decided I didn't really want to do that, um, and then was sort of finding my way. And at this moment, I had, I, we've talked about this before, but I had had really horrible anxiety. I'd found yoga and specifically Kripalu yoga um, a few years before and I decided that I wanted to be a yoga teacher. And it's interesting just looking back and we can play with this because I realized, had an insight as I looked back at the story, how many times in my life I have become passionate about something and how it affected me and then decided I was gonna teach it. <laughs> uh, it was really, really interesting. So it happened with yoga. Um, it's happened with writing. It's happened with um, it's happened with coaching. It's about to happen with EFT. It's those are just a few of the examples. But I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is hilarious because it's about to happen again. Um, and I think I like that about myself a lot. Like I was like, oh my god, I love I like that. that about you. I love that. I I love that. I'm like. I am so passionate about this thing. I need to completely understand it and I need to share it. I need to make sure everyone else can feel what I felt. So 
for you, Julie. So anyway, I'm 27. I've decided to do this yoga teacher training. I've decided to end my relationship with my boyfriend I'd had for two years that I lived with. I've decided to change my career. I've decided to just blow the shit out of it all. And I remember the day that I left for Kerpalu so vividly. And I was, as you do when you break up one relationship, I was having a raucous affair with a bad boy that I should, you know, no one should have been with. And I remember specifically that I went to see him at work. We worked together. Oh, that's a theme. And at a, at a running store, not at, you know, a corporation or anything like that. I've never did that, but at a running store. And I went to see him and it was very purely a delay of the edge. Mm -hmm. I remember I'll just do this before I head out of town. And yeah. it was so clearly a way to delay and do stir something up that I could feel that felt fun and dangerous and exciting instead of what I was going to feel by jumping off the edge and going to this yoga teacher training. And I went, I hung out and then I was like, okay, I have to go. And I got in my car and I lived in Boston at the time. And, uh oh, did I lose you? Something weird just happened. No, um, I hear you. Okay, good. I, I got in my car at a little Honda Civic. It was really, it was my first car, a little gray Honda Civic to drive from Boston to the Berkshires. So straight out the Mass Pike and cried and cried basically for two hours. And it was because I knew I was about to change everything. I knew something humongous was coming. I knew that my soul was being called to this place to do this thing. I didn't know what it was, but I felt the edge of it. I felt that I had been here and I was going here. And so there was an edge to get over. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very unknown. I had no idea what I was walking into, but at the same time, I knew I was absolutely doing the right thing. Right. And, um, and so I went and I arrived at Kripalu and I did, a, it was my 200 hour um, training. So the first, I went on to get 500 hours later at Kripalu, but this first one, it was done in something called a three by nine. And um so you went for um nine days three times so that first one was in may and then we went back in august this was 2001 and then we went back in december in a completely different world and there were actually people that had that were there i mean obviously at Kripalu during september 11th but it was a that was a wild um thing to um, to be in the middle of my training when that happened. Um, and each of those, those three segments were also edges. There were huge growths and it's so interesting to do something split up like that. That's so momentous, so momentous. That's such a deep dive because, you know, you would go and you would have this in depth nine days. And when you're doing that much yoga and it was, you know, I mean, you know, Karina, but it, it's eight hours straight of, of asana and learning philosophy and meditation and pranayam um, every day. I remember at points walking outside and looking at a tree and being able to see ev the detail of every single leaf on the tree. Um, there's such an opening. There's such a shift in the energy and it was fascinating to have these consecutive edges of going through that process and then going back home and integrating and each time i went felt like this other edge but you know i showed i i was doing that with my hands before for people who are watching 
the edge for me was not a falling off. It was a falling up. Mm -hmm. I was falling. noticing that. Yeah, it was a flying up edge. Um, and I don't even know if the edge was on the where I was standing or if the edge was up where I was going, right? It was mm -hmm. on the, the lip of the next step up. Um, so for me, when I thought, and again, as always, <laughs> you and I have this habit of doing this, which is we throw out these topics without anything in mind. And I didn't. And so I searched for the last, you know, we had last week off because of the 4th of July, but I searched for the last two weeks about my edge story. And, and for me, it, that edge really comes to, it comes to the flying up. It comes to leveling up spiritual growth, developing as a human, taking what's happening and using it as a learning. And, um, you know, I was young enough that as I made that drive and I cried, I was like, why am I crying? I didn't, I didn't fully understand. I was like, well, am I scared? Am I, I almost right. felt homesick. It was weird. And I realized it shortly after I got there and how special it was and how amazing it was that I was crying because I knew how big this was. And it did, it changed that teacher training changed my life in a million ways, including, you know, meeting my, my first spouse and you could say getting my children and, you know, kind of starting adult life. So that's my edge story. I really, I, that was just my, gonna be my first comment. I was like, it is interesting how you were showing us your edge as a step up, right? So anyone who couldn't see, that's what every time she said the word, she would do this rise up as if she was going up a step, up a ladder rung. So I thought that was really interesting because that is not the image that I was working with this week. So that's just so beautiful. And then the other thing that really um, landed with me was the time, the integration time mm -hmm. between these exhilarating and terrifying events, right, that you chose to participate in, but that you would do this leveling up from the edge, and then you would go and integrate that into your life. And then you would come back as this new version of fully integrated you, and you'd have another pod of leveling up. So three times you've got to do that over the span of a year, which is just so beautiful when we choose to, you know, meet a new group of people, learn from them, whatever their specialty is, and just elevate. I love, I love your edge. I just, it is not where I went at all. So it's really exciting to see that this is what you felt for the edge. You know, it's, as you were talking, it just occurred to me that some of the language that we use in Kripalu Yoga is when you're in a pose, an asana posture, that you play with your edge, yeah. um, right? So yeah. I'm standing in warrior two, and I get to a place where I'm really feeling it. Can I take one more breath, right? Can I, can I stay with that edge? Can I push that? And something that we've talked about a lot because of what you do um is it's amazing how quickly the body gains strength the how quickly the body gains flexibility when you practice and so that edge is so quickly surmounted in yeah. asana practice in yoga and um and i also think that there was a lot there around my edge, just this, the exact same as being in the physical posture, but my emotional edge and my mm -hmm. maturity edge being in this group, there were a hundred of us in this yoga teacher training from all walks of life, living in a dorm, um, all so think, sensitive as we're doing so much yoga. Sure. Do you think when you were driving out of picturing you in your Honda Civic, you're driving out of Boston, were you crying because you were letting go of what was behind you or you were moving toward what was ahead? Moving towards. Yeah. It was very much like, oh my God, I'm really doing this. Oh my God, I'm really doing this. I think in a way, kind of a similar thing to, 
I guess I can only speak for myself, but I've seen other people do it crying when you're getting married. Right, right, right. Like, oh my God, I can't believe this amazing thing is happening to me. I'm yeah. I'm going in and and but it's kind of terrifying. Like I'm I'm committing. I'm in. Oh my gosh. All right. It's time for a break. When we come back, Karina's gonna edge us down. No, I'm just kidding. Um <laughs> we're gonna go off a cliff. Um I'm Julie Rhodes. This is Karina Krepp. This is Stories on the Way. We are circling in on our experiences to inspire insight and action. We'll be right back. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening, uh, it's like a, a flow inside, you know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Stories on the Way. I'm Julie Rhodes here with Karina Krepp. We are circling in on our experiences to inspire insight and action. And right now, it's time to have Karina inspire us with her insights about her story around our topic this week, which is wide ranging and wild, the edge. Take the it away. Edge. The edge. Someone I could do... have talked about the U2 um, oh. guitar. That's right. No, I wasn't going to talk about my affair with him because that's private. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Don't bring that up on our show. Okay. Come okay. On. On your story. <laughs> so as I was circling around this topic, uh, we went in many different directions, but I kept landing back here as often happens. And it's, it's not, a. I don't, I'm not in a great light in this story. So, um, there's some humility and some growth that I'm going to show you. I'm going to bring us back to a time, not coincidentally, I don't believe that also I had kind of blown up my life and the way I had done it, I too had recently broken up with a boyfriend. And the important thing about that breakup was it was really breaking up with my codependency and, um, this very good girl, um, outlook. I was, I was so good and I had built so much around being a Pollyanna because frankly, that's kind of who I am at the center <laughs> and I'm very excited by life. I feel very passionate about, you know, that's so new. And I don't, I'm never the urbane one in the room because I'm like, wow, that's so cool. And so I always look like I'm 12 and I, was tired of that at this juncture in my life. And I wanted to be removed and um, urbane and mysterious. 
and all of the things that I'm really essentially not. So this edge that I'm talking about was trying to be edgy, was trying to be more of something that I am essentially not. And so the way that I decided to costume this for myself was to smoke cigarettes. And that that was going to telegraph to the world that I was this kind of woman of the universe and I had seen it all and I had done it all. And bien sûr, je peux parler en français aussi, right? I can also speak French. And it's so essentially not who I am. And it was so distant from my center that it was a facade. It was, but I thought it was edgy. And I thought that by having that as an armor, I could become more of that person. And, you know, this is also the time in my life I had just recently stopped perming my hair because I had wanted to be a curly headed person. I don't know why. I love this beautiful straight hair, but I, there was this, there's, I mean, and maybe everybody goes through this where you're like, oh, I want to be that. And so I'm going to do these horrible things to my body to try and achieve the thing that I will never be. I will never be any taller than I am. I will never have curly hair. I will never be a smoker. I will never be edgy because I am essentially a Pollyanna. I'm essentially excited by life. I'm essentially wide open to experiences and it just did not suit. But I will tell you, I'm also not a quitter. So it took me a very long time to quit smoking. And so I became this edgy version of myself. Also, I was trying to attract this guy that I thought was really sexy and he smoked. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're starting to see this, like the, my edgy story became a costume that I put on in order to be what I thought would be attractive to other people. I didn't understand that just you being you is attractive to your counterpoint. I thought that the more I was like this, other, my, my mental, my story about what kind of woman this man would want. She would be sophisticated. She would be a woman of the world. Now I was a woman of the world. I had traveled more than most people by that age. And I had done more, a lot more than most people at that age, but I was also still essentially a Pollyanna. And that was who I was trying to shed. So the sad part of the story is I was trying to get rid of myself, my essence. I was trying to cover that in a, <laughs> <laughs> waft of cigarette smoke and um and also i took up swearing pretty pretty vigorously so that, <laughs> it was, that was my era and so you will find um and i will go hunting and i'll look to find there are several photos oh and also i had these huge fingernails so i had these long claws i smoke oh this was also la femme nikita era so it was probably tied into that long fingernails cigarettes a lot of black leather and this sense of distance, which I just don't feel. And I didn't then, but I was trying, I was trying to be cool. And so there was this separation of self. And so the edge for me was what I was a contrived edge of this other version of these, you know, like I would walk into the room and I would think, well, everybody else in this room is cooler than me. They know more than me. I didn't understand everyone else was in the same place as me trying to bring their essence courageously to the surface and be accepted. And mm -hmm. so, you know, some people were better at trying that out than me, but I was trying to costume over it. And that's what I thought was edgy. And that's my edge story. And it kept, you know, it's not a beautiful story of Karina overcoming. It's a kind of a terrible story of how Karina got sucked into for years unbecoming. Right. Mm. It's so un it's so unbecoming not to be your essential self. Right. That's really was so unbecoming. And uh, I'll just tell you one little adjacent moment to this. I went at this era. I went to see my grandmother who we share the same name, the same birthday. She was a very important person in my life. And <laughs> I walked in and I think I said my red nails on and I had painted my toenails red. And my grandmother, she looks me up. She looks me down. She says, you look like a whore. And she walked away. <laughs> oh, you gotta love the elders for just calling it what they think it is. Was so, your response yeah. shit or was it? Yeah, I 
did it. No, I was so destroyed because I thought, how could you not know me? And of course it was this facade. She knew me. She was like, take down the facade. Come on, darling. This is me, right? Shortest fingernails, no nail polish, right? It's just, this is me. So yeah, it, it was a, the edge was, it was an experiment. I would like to say it lasted a very short time, but that's not true. It was several years. I was curious when you came out and was there a, when, when did you come out? When did you climb out of it? And, and was there an event that precipitated climbing back up? Yeah, the, I'll tell you, and this is what is so beautiful. And this is what we coach. Um, it's was, there was a bigger why there was a bigger purpose. And my bigger purpose was that really cool edgy guy that I was trying to attract. I did. And then I convinced him to marry me. It took him a while, but I did convince him to marry me. So now we're years down the road. And then right after we got married and I was still working as an actress. You're and still married to him? Do I know him? Still married to him. Yes. <laughs> okay now the story tell the story over now that i know who the guy was because I. oh yeah him. right now you want to listen differently yeah he was hot anyway so um he had like he, 80s rocker hair yeah oh god yeah oh god yeah i think he, he, had, the time, he had like maybe the little yeah. ponytail in the back oh my god he was so hot oh my uh, god. um we have our our taste in men is diametrically opposed it's so true it's true yeah okay. so going. uh so this guy we were, we got married and then here's what really shifted it i wanted to have babies and that was my next archetype that i was going to shift my whole world around for the next 20 years and because that that archetype was so strong with me mm -hmm. um the motherhood archetype that it was easy for me to quit smoking. It was easy for me to enforce that my husband quit smoking because I wasn't having any of that in my house. And so this shedding of this edgy person, which, you know, hadn't really stuck, like the pieces were falling off left, right and center over the years, right? <laughs> that, um, then the becoming who I was intended to be, but all the, the learning about myself through those years of, of, you, you know, you could spend, like, I will say with a lot of love in my heart, I see this in other people in my family. And while they're doing this kind of tough person thing, you think, oh, sweetheart, nobody believes that, <laughs> you know, did you stop smoking. Did the leather fall off at the same time? Was it like, it, it kind of all happened at the same time because I began embracing my next archetype. Mm -hmm. This motherhood archetype was, she was, she was probably, I mean, I'm moving into my next phase um, of that. So it's a very powerful time for me to speak about that for me, but yeah. she was such a, like, I knew when I was little, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be, what I would always say to people is I wanted to be a NICU nurse. But that's what I wanted. And because my father was an OBGYN and, you know, I spent a lot of time at the NICU or, you know, when I'd go see my father, I'd go right by the nursery. The nurses all knew me. I could go see the new babies. It was such a magical place. And if I knew myself better sooner, I would have understood. Um, hey, lady, <laughs> you're, <Yeah>. very, <laughs> you're very, I was a Pollyanna. I was here to kind of unveil the world to my kids. And that was such really a more Pollyanna and a goody two shoes and a goody two shoes as well. Oh my God. And I so didn't want to be that, but I was, I am. You are, um, you know, I had two babies in the NICU. I do know that. Yeah. That tiny, tiny babies who are now big, big, beautiful humans. Size of my hand babies. Um, yeah. Wow. I would have loved to have you in the NICU. Oh, um, I would be good at that too. Yeah. Yeah. People who are bit by that bug are really bit by that bug. After our two babies were in there, their grandmother, my mom, um, volunteered and she Aww. rocked babies in the NICU. That that was something she wanted to do because it was just oh so hard. Some every once in a while I smell the soap. Like I just get a oh. whiff somewhere and I'm like, whoa. Because you 
for people that don't know, when you walk in, you got to stand at this trough and scrub your hands for like 5 million thousand hours. I can't imagine what that was like during the pandemic. Um, anyway, <laughs> we got sidetracked. So, um, so that's so interesting. So in terms of, of how I felt like I was flying up to the edge, mm -hmm. how would you do that spatially? Like, so the, this edge, this was a, this was a fronting, right? Like it was a throwing up of, so I was picturing it like, you know, like, like when you're running up toward a cliff, right? And you don't want to see into the abyss. What I didn't want to see was who I was. I didn't want to see reflected back the truth of who I was. I was, I was pushing her away. I found her unacceptable. No, thank you. I would like instead to be this. And so I threw up, it was like a magician, this facade, this leather bound, long fingernailed cigarette smoking version of myself that was not myself. That was not an archetype that was aligned with me. It was simply a, um, an armoring. Hmm. And that I thought that if I armored myself in there, that I would be detached, that I wouldn't take things so personally, that I would understand people who were cruel. And I didn't, I didn't understand any of it. I was so attached. I took everything personally. And so by creating this kind of visual distancing, I was trying to be like I saw other people being this detached, whatever, laissez faire. I was, I'm not that. I'm very much, I'm so easily, um, I, I attach very quickly to people and I am confused by a lack of attachment or a lack of desire to be attached to me. I'm just like, but why wouldn't you? I'm really quite wonderful. Right. So it, it was this, it was, it was much more. So if, if there was a visual to it, it would be yeah. this like Batman suit in front. And then you don't know who the person in the suit is. All you see is the ears and, and the abs, right? And that's it. Stop there. Which by the way, are cat ears. Um, oh, so I know. Oh, and also the other night we were walking in the evening and a bat fully flew into my face oh. and hit me right here. And Chris was like, how do you know it was a bat? And I said, because it was warm. Like he was a oh, warm bat. body. It was a mammal. It was yeah. not a bird. Anyway. Well, that was very good immediate remembering your genus. I'm I, knew it was bat. I knew it was a bat. But there's a an interesting parallel here in that you said you didn't you didn't want to see who you were and you would ask me about my tears and they were because i knew i was about to right like i was like I i'm going and i there, there will be no hiding from myself in this place of constant yoga and i was and so i I love that connection between our stories. Um, all right, it's time for a break. When we come back, we're going to share with everyone what we found out about the edge when we looked out into the world and people that we admire and love and what they had to say about it. I'm Julie Rhodes with Karina Krepp. This is Stories on the Way. We are circling in on our experiences to inspire insight and action. And that was a lot of insight. So yeah. we'll see you back here in just a couple minutes. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. 
rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation hello i'm gonna say hello to the lovely peoples because my external person is martha beck who is my one of my great teachers and she always says that hello to the lovely peoples and i love when she says it so i'm saying it because she's my external person so here's what happened karina okay first of all i thought to myself there's an incredible podcast not to send you all away all million of you that are here but there's a great podcast by tammy simon who started this incredible incredible um media company called sounds true and her podcast is called Insights at the Edge. And so originally that's where I was going. And I, what's interesting about it, and we can bookmark this or just take it in, but the way that she talks about the edge is she says that she interviews spiritual teachers, visionary writers, and living luminaries about their newest work and current challenges, the growing edge of their inner inquiry and outer contribution to the world. Mm -hmm. And I was, that is such an interesting way to look at edge. She's looking at it between what's going on for me inside and how I'm taking it out to the world and what's that edge. I, so I thought that was fascinating, completely different. And then I listened to Martha Beck's podcast. So she has two podcasts and one is called um, Be, Bewildment. I can't remember, Bewilded something. Anyway, because they want to get from bewilderment to bewildment and go back okay. to wild. And it's her and her partner, Rowan. And they're, what they were talking about was what they called the pull. And the pull is what took me to Kripalu. It's what everything that I brought up at the beginning when I, you know, I fell in love with yoga and I felt so drawn to it. And then I felt drawn to teach it. And, you know, with coaching, I felt so drawn to the work and then I felt drawn to go through coach training. And then I felt drawn to actually coach and it's an undeniable pull, right? I mean, it's, this is where I'm going and you can go kicking and screaming, or you can just follow <laughs> and walk into it. But I thought it was so interesting because they were really talking about that concept of the pull and they had some really beautiful ways of thinking about it, including when you think about magnets, um, you know, and when it, when you have that pull, it's a real suck. And when you're going the wrong direction, sometimes you just can't, you just kept getting, getting pushed back. Like when the, when the magnets are the opposite way, I love that feeling. And, but the reason that it connected and I was so fascinated by it was because everything they were talking about with the pull in every circumstance and every which way that they were analyzing it was all leading to an edge mm -hmm. every single time. And um, the, the concept I really wanted to share that they talked about, which I think is so much fun. And it was, uh, Martha Beck's cousin who told her that 
instead of telling a story, like in Martha's, um, in Martha's case, um, I was born into Mormonism in Utah. And so I became someone who helps people get out of really sticky life situations as a life coach, do it backwards. I was meant to be a life coach and explore how people get stuck in st sticky situations and help them get out of it. And so mm -hmm. I was born into a very strict Mormon family in Utah. I love it. And so it's so interesting because we're looking at the edge and you can look at it from that moment where you pull up to the edge and then where you went, or you can look at it from here I am on the other side of my edge and what happened before it, and why did I need to be there? And how did, you know, why, you know, it's like, I need to be, I am meant to be a teacher. I mean, my purpose is to see and know suffering and alchemize that into peace, love, joy, and abundance for myself and everyone around me. And so I cried all the way to Western Massachusetts to go to yoga teacher training. I like um, the I like the backwards. Um yeah, because you know, in our coaching, we we call it the pain teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why were you in this? Why was this your family of origin? Why? So that you could learn how to unstick yourself so that you could learn how to be compassionate so that you could learn, mm -hmm. you know, all of the things, all the tools that you will need to be of service in the way that you are, your gifts are crafted to be of service in this life. Mm -hmm. Right. I love, I love that. And you are so of service in that way. And I'm so glad that you cried all the way toward <laughs> the future <laughs> me too well and it's such a um i think it's a it's a, an appreciation or gratitude practice because then you're able to say you know i want to help alleviate suffering in the world and so i had a horrible horrible lost four years of college i want to alleviate suffering suffering in the world and so I was born into a family where I was told that I was special and I could do anything and I was wonderful to be around. Mm -hmm. I think you can, you can play with it in all of those ways and they become appreciation for your life, yeah. the, the good and the bad and the hard and the easy. So, um, yeah, I just thought it was such a cool concept. And I also just think that it's, it is also very interesting and important when you're looking at that topic of the edge to say, well, there has to be some force, there has to be some pull, or why would you go anywhere near the edge? That's right. That's exactly it. Yes. Right. But I think, you know, also my my outside perspective on the edge was a little bit about who how you learn about yourself when your toes are curled over the edge and that there are things that you can only know, no, not forecast, not anticipate, not hope, but you will only know when your toes are over the edge, how you will respond from mm. this person that you are today. Not that you can't change or improve or, or, or write a new script for tomorrow's version. But mm -hmm. what I was, um, I was looking into a lot of the stuff around edge and edgy is fashion related. You know, he's so edgy. Edgy is now actually, as my children will tell me, is now an insult because it is perceived as this like facade. This it's oh, cliche. It's, it's like cliche at the point, like, oh, he's so edgy. Costuming. So I kind of went down that road for a while, but then really the outside was back to the inside. So I kind of love how you talked about that, the edge of, you know, what we're manifesting from within and um, what, how that's being expressed in our world. I 
every year I do something that scares me or that I'm not good at because I think it makes me a better coach. And many years ago, what I was doing that scared me and that I was not good at was rock climbing because I'm very afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. And so I would literally get to the edge and there's all of this harness rope belay friend. There's all of this support Mm -hmm. so that you can be on the edge, but not really, right? You can get to like, I, my body was, you know, terrified. My body was shit. Like we're dying. We're going to die. Don't let go of the way, you know, you start pumping out, you're on this wall and you're thinking, and you know, your belay person is like, it's okay. I've got you. Go ahead. You know, and I would start down climbing, right? Instead of, I couldn't reach up anymore. It's too scared. Right. I could not go any higher. I had reached my edge, but instead of letting go to see if I could fly, I wanted to stay in control in it. So I would start down climbing. And I just want you to know, because you know, um, the person who was on belay was my friend, John Shahaki, who had me, right? He really had me, but I couldn't trust at that time. And then fast forward many, many years, I'm in Dubai um, and I'm still afraid of heights, just so you know, I did not cure myself of that. I'm still very, very thoughtful. So we went up to the world's tallest building, which is the Burj Khalifa in in Dubai. And you take this super fast elevator, which is very exciting. And and you literally, you feel like your soul stayed on the earth and you're flying your body up. And, you know, 10 minutes in, it, it finds you again. And I was, you get out and it's all surrounded by glass. And my kids were making fun of me because I wouldn't go sit at the edge. I wouldn't get close to, it felt so dangerous to me. Oh my God, I, you couldn't have paid me to go close to that building just so we're clear. So all good. So what I realized was that, you know, when I was young, I had a, I had a, when I learned about atoms, I stopped going on top of things because I thought, <laughs> <laughs> because it's not solid. It's just molecules bouncing it's, around. What's this is, what? this is not reasonable. I'm not stepping up on anything. So, you know, my oh, faith God. in the solidity of the universe, in the engineers, my faith in humanity had grown enough that I would take this elevator up, that I would step out into this rotunda and that I would look kind of so I could see the edge, but I still same in the CN Tower in Toronto, I won't go right to the edge because my body feels, this is what my body feels. Cause I've sat with it for every time we do one of these things, my kids laugh at me. I think I'm too valuable. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. That would be such a terrible, silly way to die. I've got a lot more work to do and my body is saying no, 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 no. So I just think it's interesting when we think about our edges, like sometimes toes over teaches us about what we're afraid of, but sometimes Mm -hmm. four steps back teaches us about what we value. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful, Karina. That's so beautiful. All right. When we come back, we are going to talk about action and we're going to find out next week's topic. Um, this is Stories on the Way. I'm Julie Rhodes with Karina Krepp. We are circling in on our experiences to inspire insights and actions. There's been a lot of insights and I'm excited for the actions. We'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening, uh, like a, a flow inside, you know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. 
Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back. It's action time. So our topic is the edge. And after all of these insights today, Karina, what action do you think you might take when you think about the edge going forward in your days? I think that what has changed under the microscope of examination is um, in all of my stories about the edge, there has been a sense of danger and the danger always inspires fear and then the fear often has inspired historically a reaction and one of the reactions was facade another reaction was retreat and um i think that what i'd like to do is just get to the forefoot from the edge and pause and then let the clouds blow the fear away and then wait for the inspiration. What has changed over the years is that I now really listen to my ancestors and I just ask for help and guidance. And I, what's, what, what's the best for me, for what, for my purpose? Is it to step forward one more foot? Is it to stay right here and wait for the Eagle to carry me? What is it? What am I supposed to do here at the edge? Say more about the forefoot. So remember what I was saying earlier is like there's there's a beautiful knowing when your toes are over the edge, curled mm-hmm. over the edge, and you know, you're looking down or you're looking up in your case for what's coming or where you could go. But that m- my value has taught me that four feet back from the edge, preserves me and that in that position i can still see right i can still make a decision from there without feeling you know when you talk about anyone else who i've ever spoken to who is afraid of heights i'm not afraid of heights i'm afraid of this magnetic pull and the void seems to have I am the other half of the magnet and the void seems to draw me toward it. Mm. And that's what terrifies me. God, when my kids were little, I was so afraid, not that I would drop them, but I would be pulled in to this magnetism of the void. And that's why I value myself enough to stand four feet back. And I think this is good. I can see and I'm not terrified, but I'm also not already leaning toward falling mm-hmm. down. Or okay. All right. Several things. First of all, when you said four foot, I thought you meant like, you know, on an animal, they're four paw. Oh, I was like the foot, the foot <laughs> that's in front. You're like, that was an end. You know, we had just that's had the conversation dollars. about being four feet. It still happened. Um, second of all, I completely relate to that pull, that feeling. I really do. I I know exactly what you mean. And you know, they say for fear of heights, it's not that you're afraid of heights, it's that you're either afraid of falling or you're afraid of jumping. Yes, it's the jumping. Yeah, yep. And well, with an added layer of jumping because I was called. Um, So I totally get that, which is interesting because right, my external point of view from Rowan and 
Martha was about the pull. Yeah. And, you know, when you, even when you, you know, they talked a lot about how when there's a pull, lots of times, all of a sudden there are all these coincidences and, you know, Martha told a story about how she was trying, she really was thinking about leaving at one point Phoenix and moving to this like forest land in California near San Luis Obispo. And she was kind of like, oh, but I really want to do this. She'd been looking at this property for months and she was going to buy it. And she was in Phoenix and she pulled up to a red light and the car in front of her had a bumper sticker that said, welcome to San Luis Obispo. <laughs> so, and we can, I mean, you and I, you know, this just happened to me with my EFT training. It just, it just kept coming. There was a podcast, then there was a this, then I looked for a training. It was this week. I could go. It was, a, it was, it's sometimes when it's right, it just, the path is just lazy. It just, I imagine it in a movie, like all the bricks just like going out onto the path. So it's so cool. So um, I think my action honestly is going to be around um, the telling the story backwards. I'm really intrigued. That by it. And I think it's a really positive spin. And one of my deepest insights from this discovery, this on this topic was how I always think of myself as a fatalist and being pretty negative, but in all of this, I was so positive. My edge was up my, my, how many times has this happened that I found something that I got pulled in and then I wanted to learn it so I could share it so much positivity and generosity. And I, um, I'm going to be 50 in three days. And I just, what a beautiful thing to see and know and reflect um, as I turn 50. What a gift. I didn't know it when I said the edge, but again, I was pulled. I didn't say that. Someone else said that it just came out of my mouth. Okay. So Karina, we're almost out of time. So tell us what is next week's topic? Oh, next week's topic is beautiful. It is travel. Oh, I love it. I already know my story. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> That's never happened. That's um, great. Oh, I can't wait. Space travel, mind travel, time travel, American Airlines travel. Oh, oh my gosh. It's endless. The opportunities are endless. It is true. All right. Thank you all for joining us. This is Stories on the Way. Don't forget to go to storiesonthewayshow.com. We have a little after the show blog post where we put pictures and tell extra stories if they come up and you can comment. We really, really want to hear from you. So that's a great place to do it. I'm Julie Rhodes. This is Karina Krepp. We are here, Stories on the Way, circling in on our experiences to inspire insight and action. We hope that we've inspired something for all of you. And we'll see you on the way.